Hey everybody, welcome back to another great episode of the Mysterious Huntsman Podcast. I'm stoked tonight to have this guest on because he's he's written so many books and he's been in several documentaries where he's produced, narrated, uh, hosted. He is a rock star, basically uh, started a rock band called Ghoul Town and his name is Lyle Blackburn. He's a native of Texas and he's kind of known for his writing, his music and his film. Lyle is also a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with George Nori. He has been featured on numerous television shows, including Animal Planet, Destination America, Discovery Science, A&E, and his work with Monsters and Mysteries in America was outstanding. And, you know, you name it, he's done it. And I'm just, like I said, I'm stoked to have him here tonight. I'm actually shocked he's talking to me on my little feeble podcast, but... I appreciate it all the same, and let's welcome Lyle into the Mysterious Huntsman podcast. Hey, Lyle, this is Paul with the Mysterious Huntsman podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I'm excited. I know I've told several people that you're going to be coming on, and and you've got an extensive resume, and... uh, I just wanted to have you on and pick your brain and, you know, tell us, uh, at least my audience here around Nashville, what you've got going on and, you know, what's coming up for you and just a little bit about um, how you got started into this. Um, so I'm just going to let you, uh, well, first of all, I want to say I, I enjoy all your shows and um, definitely your uh, interviews. I've heard you on Coast to Coast a few times and, you know, it, it's just amazing at some of the stuff that it's happening out there and you know all these credible witnesses coming forward and i really appreciate guys like you getting out there putting boots on the ground and um just taking charge and bringing this to light for everybody but uh i appreciate you and i'm going to let you just get started at it okay yeah uh well yeah thanks for having me on i i I like the name of your podcast or show and so i thought now that sounds like something uh (laughs) that i'd like to do so you know um but, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, I've been in, interested in since I was a kid, you know, the whole paranormal, uh, you know, when I was young, I would watch any show that had to do with ghosts and UFOs or Bigfoot, uh, things like that. So, you know, it was just something that always interested me. And, uh, I, I live in Texas and I was born here and always lived here. And, uh, at some point, you know, I had, uh, the good fortune, I guess, to be at a drive-in theater and saw the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek, which was a, a movie made in the early 70s that dramatized sightings of a Sasquatch-like creature in southern Arkansas. And the location of that, a uh, little town called Falk, was only about three hours from where I lived uh, near Fort Worth, Texas. And so that, that really kind of drove it home for me, captured my imagination, because prior to that, uh, you know, most things like, you know, Bigfoot was in the Pacific Northwest, Loch Ness Monster was in Scotland, things seemed very far away and sort of out of my own backyard or backwoods, so to speak, and having grown up uh, hunting with my father, you know, was in the woods from really as far back as I can remember, you know, I was familiar with all these old small towns and, and wooded areas. So when I saw the legend of Boggy Creek, which was kind of, you know, in this area, that really, you know, just grabbed me. So that that kind of planted the seed. And then um, I spent the majority of my life either as a musician, um, was in some bands, and we toured around the world and so forth. And uh, in between that, I kind of made a living as a writer which I was always good at that, and I wrote for some rock magazines and horror magazines and so forth. So at some point, um, you know, more than a decade ago, I had the idea to write a book, and I thought, man, you know, what is my favorite types of su- subjects? What would I want to write a book on? And I thought, you know, I love, you know, cryptids and paranormal and unexplained mysteries, and I thought The Legend of Boggy Creek. And so I knew that was based on real sightings that people had had, you know, in the town. And you know, the movie was made and kind of dramatized those sightings. But I really didn't know, you know, what was truth, what was sensationalized or fictionalized for, for the movie. And so I kind of just started there. And I, 
you know, went up to this little town and started interviewing people about, you know, the happenings that had gone on there and tried to find as many of the original witnesses as I could. And, you know, that was interesting because now I'm talking to people who, you know, had quote unquote seen a, a monster in real life, you know, things that were very unexplainable, but these were credible people, you know, and I quickly learned that it's, you know, things happen to normal everyday people that, you know, remain a mystery. So I wrote the book, quickly got a deal that came out um, and was instantly kind of a hit because I, I think I kind of picked the right subject and I had skill at writing, I guess. And um, quickly thereafter, television shows started calling me. They were kind of starting to do a lot of these Bigfoot subjects. And so I, I ended up on a show called Monsters and Mysteries in America, doing some several episodes and uh, worked with them. I was on Finding Bigfoot and some other various shows. And so that really helped things. And um, it sort of just cast me into this, uh, you know, adult world of examining mysteries that I had loved as a kid. So now I was coming at them with a little more thoughtfulness, skepticism, but open-mindedness as to what, you know, could be behind these cases. And I, I learned that in, in, in the case of Boggy Creek, for example, that it wasn't just kind of a historical thing. There was people that had sightings all along, and there was people that had recent sightings. It's just that they weren't, you know, dramatized or not in the paper. So once I started digging into it, I found uh, sort of a network of people that, you know, I was interviewing that had strange experiences. So from there, I, I thought, well, this is good, you know, and I continued on with that. And I've written four additional books and been on TV shows and started working with a company called Small Town Monsters that does documentaries on these subjects. And um, ever since then, I've just been in, immersed in this sort of field of cryptozoology and um, paranormal, um, you know, and, and it's just been super fun. And every day is a, is a new experience because, as you probably know, uh, people report strange things all the time, so there's there's never a lack of something to pursue. And in fact, there's really too much that I can follow up on. So I kind of specialize mostly in cryptozoology, but um, but you know I appreciate all the all the disciplines therein and sightings of anything strange and mysterious. Yeah, no doubt. I, um, you know, going back to the legend of Boggy Creek, I too, as a kid, saw this. Um, probably later in the seventies, uh, at home one night. And, you know, I lived in, I grew up in Southern Alabama and no neighbors whatsoever and just straight out in the woods. So watching this film, you know, as a kid, it really, uh, it really freaked me out to where the point where I didn't want to go outside for the next few days. But, um, you know, as I, as I got a little older, um, I was like, this is, could be really real. And then I started, uh, you know, back then we didn't have the great internet and all this. So, you know, you go to the library, you pick up books. I, I started grabbing any magazine I could and looking up everywhere that may have had these things. And like you said, I really thought these things were mostly Pacific Northwest. But as I got to researching and reading, they were all over the place. And we even had, you know, our version down in South Alabama on into Florida called the Skunk Ape or or some people in my area would call it the the booger. Um, but, you know, all the names, it still came back to Bigfoot. And it was incredible. And I jumped in from there, you know, kind of like you. I, I went straight into the ghost stuff and then uh, also picked up the, you know, Close Encounters came out in, I think, 77. And that really took me away. But I started seeing a pattern forming of all of, all of this stuff taking place. And, you know, it, as the... As time went on, it just kept building bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just it just took me on a path, and I've, I've kind of been on it my entire life, um, especially with a career in law enforcement and getting a, you know, going to these strange calls where everybody thought these people were crazy, but in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, I think there's something going on here, so I kept digging a little deeper, and uh, I have no clue where I was headed with any of this, but just to say that um, it's really put me on a path and, um, all the shows that have been on recently 
have just kind of stoked the the fire. And and with the new age of information or the technology that's out, we're getting we're getting inundated with all these reports. And like you said, it's just so much to keep up with. It's probably good that you're specialized in one area, but um, it's it's really ramping up, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. I've seen a increased interest in this over definitely over the last decade, and you know, from when I started to now, it's just uh, there's so many more Facebook groups and paranormal groups of all sorts and Bigfoot groups. It, it's really kind of at an all-time peak. I mean, the 70s were kind of what's known as kind of the golden age of, of the high strangeness of, of, you know, when all this stuff really started coming out, you know, shows like Chariots of the Gods and um, In Search of on TV and, oh yeah, uh, you know, the Patterson film, Gimlin film being seen. And so that was kind of when it really sort of came to life. But I think at this point, I mean, there's, definitely more people interested in this than ever. I mean, there's, I mean, there's conferences in, in the, the, you know, in festivals that go on. I mean, the, the Mothman festival just happens. I, I think it's like 12,000 or 13,000 people show up at this thing. So, you know, that just shows you how many people are interested in it, you know, whether they're just sort of mildly interested or think it's cool or whether they're like seriously trying to, you know, research and, and learn about it. So it's cool that that's going on because certainly it it supports what I'm doing if I'm writing books and there's more people that are potentially going to, you know, buy those. It helps perpetuate me to be able to keep writing books and, and so forth. Yeah, agreed. And um, I, I, I was speaking with uh, the Tennessee director for MUFON up here, which is, a you know, the Mutual UFO Network, the other day and uh, she and I were talking and it's just it, it's like there's a whole new shift going on in, in either the consciousness or 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 just the world in general people are becoming more open to these things and I wonder if if we're if we're having more sightings because we're opening our minds to it or are we just just opening up in general you know I think it's a little bit of the all things. I think that because of these television shows, people have seen that, you know, it's not just crazy people that see, you know, Bigfoots or UFOs or what have you. It's, you know, you know, it's, there's just everyday people that have seen things they can't explain. So I think it makes people more willing to say, oh, yeah, you know, I saw something like that. And they, it's not like, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, where if you said something like that, people just, laughed you off. I mean, you're still going to, you still maybe get ridiculed at work or what have you, but it's not the same thing. And, uh, but also I think that these shows and all these groups have also perpetuated people reporting or interpreting things, you know, that may not be good solid sightings as, you know, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I saw something. But, uh, yeah, I definitely did, you know, because nobody wants to be in a group and go out ghost hunting or Bigfoot hunting and have no results. But, I mean, you know, these paranormal events aren't something you can just conjure up or, you know, a lot of it's just right place, right time. So, you know, it's it's good and bad that people are more willing to be forthcoming with the sightings, but also it creates a lot of what I think is white noise of, of sightings that aren't, aren't of good quality or not really um, worth documenting, I guess. Sure, and, and, and uh, I mean, go back to what you were saying uh, it does take like tons of hours. It, I mean, if you're going on a, on a hunt or whether it be cryptid or paranormal or night watches, whatever, you may be out there for hours or weeks, days, whatever, you know, not in a row, but you may not get anything. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a daunting task, but you know, you'll find the passionate ones that stick with it. And, you know, it's their endurance that, or their passion for it that uh, keeps them out there. And, you know, after a, several nights or a week or two of like maybe trying to get EVPs or some kind of uh, video or footage on a full spectrum camera, whatever, um, you might get one little clip that might be worth it. So it's, it's like uh, people think you can, I mean, they're watching these shows and they think, well, we'll just go out there, swing a baseball bat at a tree, do a few hoops and hollers. In one night, and expect some type of uh, response, and 
you know, just, uh, it, I, I know you know this way more than I do or any, most people, but it just doesn't work that way. Right. Yeah. I think those, <laughs> it's as anything, you know, like television isn't reality. And even a lot of the shows, you know, are not, don't have the integrity they should in this. And I, I'm very careful about which, which shows I agree to be on. I get, I get offers all the time to, you know, develop my own show or be on certain shows. And a lot of it, I just, you know, I don't feel that they're, uh, you know, have the same level of integrity or intention that I have. So I, I try to be careful with television, just like anything, you know, or even the internet, you know, I've written books on things that I can look on Wikipedia and there's all kinds of misinformation and wrong facts and, you know, once I go back to the original sources, whether that's the original newspaper articles or the witnesses themselves, um, you realize that even the Internet is not accurate in some of the historic events, you know, uh, at least as far as what I know in Bigfoot sightings and cryptozoology. So people got to be careful with that. And, you know, a lot of the best material is still books. Like you said, you went out and, and looked for books. You know, it's those in my opinion, are the best, you know, if you want to look up the history of Bigfoot sightings or in the history of, of whatever different paranormal, paranormal cases, some of these original books are going to be closer to the actual truth than uh, some watered-down version on television or trumped-up thing on the Internet. So, you know, that's that's something to keep in mind if you're trying to kind of research the history of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't dig deep enough, (laughs) there's a lot of people who think Wikipedia is the be all end all. But I mean, anyone can go on there and edit Wikipedia. And and I hope most people know that. But um, I, you know, you're you're talking about going back out looking or picking up books or magazines. I remember um, specifically, uh, you know, in the in back in the when I was a kid, I would get like UFO magazine or maybe I think it might've been 40 in times or fate magazine. And I just enjoyed sitting on my front porch in a swing, you know, in the hot summer of the South reading about things like the, the Thunderbirds the that are the possible pterodactyl sightings in the, in the Southwest. And the, of course the Bigfoot sightings all over the place. But I do remember reading about um, the legend of Boggy Creek a good bit. And, that's still an amazing story. That whole Falk area um, is just littered with swampland, right? That comes down into Texas and maybe bumps some of Louisiana. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's pretty swampy there. It's uh, the area is the Sulphur River Wildlife Area, and within that, there's a place called Mercer Bayou, and that's where a lot of the sightings have taken place. And that all kind of, if you kind of go south. We're southeast from Falk, you're, you're getting into East Texas, which people don't realize is, is, is very heavily forested, pine forests, and you have swampy areas because you're right on the border of Louisiana. So, yeah, that all that contiguous area is very swampy. It's very, I mean, there's a lot of it that's undeveloped. I mean, if, if people who say, oh, there's no place for these things to be, it's like if I dropped you in the middle of, uh, Mercer Bayou, you have a hard time finding your way out because there's just so much area and, and it's so, you know, swampy and and so forth. And I've spent, you know, many many nights and many hours up and down those all of those areas, and you know, it, it kind of gives me a, a different perspective on what the possibilities are that a small population of some undocumented, you know, ape-like creature could possibly, you know, live back in there and, and nobody be able to really, you know, prove or disprove it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and if they have the intelligence level of that, you know, even the intelligence level of uh, an ape or even beyond, I mean, they can they can just stay away from everybody. And, you know, they, they're probably very adapted to it. And... I, it's like a, a, I just flew back from uh, San Francisco just a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago. And if anyone were to get in a plane and fly across the country, you 
like you said, it's just so it's more vast than people think. You can't you can't look at it on a map or watch it on TV. There are just so many unpopulated places that you can just walk for days, weeks, months, even without ever making it out or seeing anyone. And, you know, it, it's kind of a, I, I get tired of hearing that same old uh, story. Well, you know, we would have seen one by now or someone would have hit one. Someone would have shot one. You know, and I was like, I tell them, well, there's reports that say we have. But, uh, you know, I, I try not to get into the debate because when you get into someone that's super shut off and closed minded, you're really not going to get anywhere. <laughs> and, and I know you, you know that. But um, now I was, I was wanting to bring us down to like into Texas. There's a lot of activity going on, like in the big thicket area. Is that does that kind of also connect up into the areas we were talking about with Falk, or is that something completely different? Uh, it doesn't really connect uh, to that to the same woods. It's it's further south um, from there, but it is a it is definitely an area that is vast and it really so heavily wooded. It, it, I mean, the name Big Thicket obviously. Uh, says it all. It, it's one of those places that you really have a hard time even hiking through because it's it's not only thick, but there's um, there's swampy areas, uh, holes and <laughs> ponds, and uh, every sort of insect known to man. And that that's just really one of the one of the most rugged areas I've ever been in. And you know, quite perhaps not coincidentally. There's a history of sightings of creatures in there, um, up in that area. Some of the the old timers call it Old Aussie Back. And I, I oh, love really? those old names. You, you know, like you've got the Fountain Monster or Boggy Creek Monster, and then if you were right on the border of between um, Texas and Louisiana, there's a river called the Sabine, and there's a you know, legends there talk of the Sabine thing. And then if you get down in the big thicket, you got old mossy back. I mean, they're essentially described as Bigfoot-like creatures, but it's just kind of that regionalized name that kind of, you, you know, people refer to it as, which gives it a little more character, um, I think, you know. And uh, that's the fun part about the South with all the names. Like you said, the Alabama, uh, you know, you got Skunk A, Booger, White Thing, uh, different names out there. And, um, but, yeah, the, the big thicket is... The big thing is one of my favorite areas also because there were there were some legends and and like sightings of what people described as looking like Native Americans. Like uh, there was a guy working on I believe he was working on the telephone lines out there and was up on a pole and was shot at by <laughs> what he described as, as as an Indian with a bow and arrow. Really, and it. it really got me to thinking that there was a tribe called the Karen Kawas, which was kind of a, almost like a really violent cannibalistic tribe that sort of was considered, you know, wiped out and they lived in, in the East Texas area. But, um, you know, I thought, Hey, it's not out of the question that it was, they moved back into the big thicket and a small population that survived in there not unlike some of these really small tribes in the Amazon. And I thought, how cool would that be if there was a hidden tribe of, of Native Americans living in the thick of thicket? It's kind of kind of scary, and you know, if you're hunting out there. But that's another just a cool thing associated with that area. No, it, yeah, that really is. I, I haven't heard about that. I'll have to um, keep my ears open. Yeah, there's a book um, by a late colleague of mine named Rob, Rob Riggs, um, and... He has a book um, about the big thicket. Uh, let's see what's the name? It's called uh, um, The Wild Man. Uh, it's called In the Big Thicket on the Trail of the Wild Man, but it's by Rob Riggs. You can still get a hold of the book. It, okay. It's a really cool book, and um, the Indian stuff is in there and old mossy back and everything. No, it sounds good. I'll have to definitely check into that. Now, we were talking about um, like some of the different names and I kind of want to move us now down into uh, I'm just, I'm just taking you along my journey here. I'm just, I'm just picking your brain fast as I can. So um, 
the Honey Island Swamp Monster. I know you've heard about that. Do you think that is that is this also maybe another name for Bigfoot? Because I know some of the locals think it's uh, maybe like what's called a dog man or a or a the Rougarou or the a werewolf in that area. Uh, yeah, I'm quite familiar with Honey Island as well. I've, I've even been down there uh, a couple of times in the area. Um, that one, the descriptions, the majority of descriptions kind of describe it as something a little bit different than your kind of ubiquitous Bigfoot. And it it has been described as looking a little more dog-like. I mean, it's, it walks on two legs, right bipedal, but um, it's a little thinner by description, and the the confusing thing is that the tracks that have been associated with this uh, have three toes and look almost reptilian, um, which is so, so there's some issues or, or dubious parts about some of the tracks that have been found. So it's it's hard to say whether. You know, those are really tracks of the creature and, and all that stuff. But uh, the Honey Island Swamp Monster, in my mind, is is something that stands out as its own entity, is a little bit different than Bigfoot. Um, and I, I've interviewed quite a few witnesses, and even some that uh, go back in the 60s, which is kind of the time when it first started becoming known. And uh, it, it's just a really cool... I've always liked the Honey Island Swamp Monster as far as the legends and um, there in there where that is, it's um, a little bit east of New Orleans. So obviously it's very swampy down there um, along the Pearl River, which is almost a Mississippi. And it, that area back there is another place where uh, there's just miles and miles of, of forests and bottomlands and river channels and just all all sorts of um, wild lands where, you know, again, a small population of something could exist. And uh, the, the Rougarou kind of fits in there because that's a Cajun werewolf kind of legend in which I've always thought of as more legend than cryptid. But, you know, it, whereas the Honey Island Swamp Monster, and I've literally interviewed witnesses, I've never really found somebody who's you know, seeing a Rougarou, so to speak. So that kind of blurs the line between folklore and, and what I consider cryptid, solid cryptid sightings, but all of it very interesting. Oh, absolutely. Um, I know they're steeped in uh, lore and legend and heavy uh, voodoo. Uh, is it or voodoo or hoodoo, I guess, and, and sometimes in the area they kind of talk back and forth with it. But um, I wonder if some of it didn't... Uh, on a spiritual or slash demonic realm of something. I, I know, I know you've ran into people there. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk here lately of this, even Bigfoot or anything like that being maybe like a, um, interdimensional or ultra dimensional or, or how do you feel about any of that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, you know, there, that's kind of become a popular theory that, I think is inevitable because when you go, there's been more than 50 years of Bigfoot research and we don't have a specimen to show for it. You know, I think it, that situation lends itself to people coming up with more radical theories. Not that these weren't already there. I mean, guys like John Keel and others had already proposed these sort of interdimensional type theories, but, right. um, you know, when I got into Bigfoot research years ago or looking at these things, it was mostly all the researchers were pretty uniformly uh, consistent in that they were looking for what they consider to be a flesh and blood biological creature who was, you know, either, uh, you know, some sort of undocumented ape or there was some sort of a hominid that you know, had some lineage to, uh, you know, more human type origins or, or something along those lines, but nonetheless biological. Um, this whole shift to thinking Bigfoot's interdimensional, um, for me, I, you know, I've interviewed hundreds of witnesses and I just don't see a lot of any of that behavior. All the sightings to me seem like some sort of a 
terrestrial animal that was, you know, people underestimate what animals can do. You know, it disappeared. Well, you know, every bit of a, of a animal is designed to blend in with the forest. I've done training with Marines who they could, they were standing right in front of me until they moved. I, I never even saw them. And these are just humans, you know, and, if you know what you're doing and you know you're designed to blend into these environments, you can very much appear and disappear through those woods, appearing, possibly appearing, you know, supernatural of some sort. But uh, you know, I just kind of stick with the theory that these are some sort of undocumented flesh and blood creatures, and until I see or know different, I just kind of stick with that theory. But that doesn't mean that I, you know. I'm mean, correct, and all of this is just speculation at best. So, um, you know, I think that all these theories are just kind of generated by our by our <laughs> by our frustration of the search for these <laughs> things. Yeah, and that that makes sense because I mean they say, well, there's only one footprint, so it must have, you know, blipped off the radar, <laughs> off the screen. But I mean, all the all the accounts that you've heard or we've heard. I mean, these things have uh, been seen carrying off animals, breaking, uh, you know, deer, snatch. I mean, you know, any kind of interdimensional, I doubt it's going to be hungry or have to eat. You know, it's like, you know, it's going to be here. It's in the physical world. It's it's trapping food or it's it has to eat. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah and, and, an, and another reason I think that is it is because it, from what I no, you know, in my experience, most of the Bigfoot sightings are always in places where it makes sense to see some large animal like that. They're interdimensional. How come we don't see one? Oops, it popped up in suburbia right in the middle of your street because, you know, if it's popping in and out of dimensions, why didn't it show up <laughs> at, at Walmart? You know what I mean? It's like, but the sightings are very much consistent with places that make the most sense right where you know like where you would find bear or any other you know mountain lions or any other large animals so that to me also kind of goes against the you know popping in and out of dimensions thing yeah i agree well man uh i guess i just won't keep you too much longer um i appreciate you coming on tonight and I hope, you know, I haven't bored you too much. I hope I can have you back again. If something, you know, major breaks loose, I'd love to, like, uh, pick your brain some more. But if you would, could you tell everyone that's listening, you know, how they can get in touch with you or, or you know, or, or to buy your books and watch your uh, documentaries? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the best place to start would be my website, com and com and that's got uh, links to my books. Um, you can buy them from my online store there, or you can uh, can obviously get them on Amazon and in ebook and print form. Uh, and then uh, the documentaries I've been involved with, which is quite a few, our newest movie being Momo the Missouri Monster, which is also the subject of my latest book. Those are viewable on streaming platforms like Amazon Prime, uh, Vimeo, um, places like that. Um, and so all, all those, all the information of that is on my website as well. So, um, yeah, just, just check that out. And there's obviously contact information on there if you've got a sighting uh, that you want to share with me. And I'd be glad to, uh, to check it out. So, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. And, always interesting uh, to talk to like-minded people and uh, be glad to come on again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to ask you, uh, are you still, uh, is, is your band still playing out? Are you still touring any with that? Yeah, actually I do. Uh, I have a band called Ghoul Town, which I've had for quite a number of years, which is um, kind of what I was doing professionally before I kind of got sidetracked into that. So, um, the fan base is there, so I, I still try to keep that up uh, as possible. And sometimes that gives me a reason to take a road trip and, <laughs> and veer off and do some research on the side. So it kind of works hand in hand. But uh, yeah, there's links to Ghoul Town from my side. You can get 
get our music on iTunes and Amazon and anywhere, you know, download music, you can, you can find that. That sounds awesome. And if uh, you guys ever get to Nashville, I'm going to look you up or let me know if you're coming to play here anywhere in this venue around here. But, um, man, I appreciate you and thanks for uh, all the work that you're doing to kind of keep this on the forefront. And um, I look forward to having you back on again soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Lyle, and take care, buddy. Okay. Thanks, man. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. And that's it for another episode of Mysterious Huntsman. It's the interview with Lyle Blackburn, cryptozoologist, filmmaker, music maker, just an all-around great guy, really, really cool to talk to. Um, I hope he comes back again. And remember, in the meantime, guys, if you have any stories, encounters of Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, I don't care what it is, just reach out to me at mysterioushuntsman at gmail.com. Or you can find me on my new website, MysteriousHuntsman.com. And there's also a link on the front page that will take you straight to the podcast so you can listen to all your favorite shows. All right, guys. Have a great rest of the week. And remember, hunt the truth no matter how far it takes you and what it takes to get there.